people look at picturesque postcards of Ireland and they talk about the rolling hills. Like, it wasn't like that. It was once covered in forest and you wouldn't see the hills like we see them today. And, and it's very easy to imagine what it might have been like covered in forest. And it's tragic to realise how much has been taken. It is. And um, the authentic landscape of Ireland is Western Atlantic temperate rainforest, you know, dominated by oak, oak canopy. And um, as I say, the, today, the remains of the primeval woodlands, it's 0.002%, okay? In any other country, that would be considered a crisis, and there would be remedial action in place. In this country, these little remnant shreds of the great forest of Ireland, they're They've been turned into SAC, Special Areas of Conservation, or National Heritage Areas, in the care of the National Parks Wildlife Service, most of them. There are no plans to allow their expansion. And the, the problem uh, with that is that they're basically, they're being fossilized. And there's no, there's no uh, dynamic, there's no, they're too small. You know, we can't bring back the great forests as they were. We've got to much bigger population, we've got towns and villages that, you know, have been established. We, we'll never see the great forests in, in the way our ancestors would have seen them. We can certainly in, increase the tree cover, you know, from the, the, the lowly figure that it is, and as I say, we can create linear forests, we can restore our hills. We would propose regeneration as the main method with some planting natural succession whereby the birches come in, the willows, they self-seed. Uh, gorse, gorse is forgotten. Gorse is part of the 28 nat uh, nat natural uh, species of tree and shrub. Going back to the Brehan laws, the, all 28 trees and shrubs were listed into four groups of seven in order of importance. They, and this is where we get the OM alphabet from as well, isn't it? But the elm would be part, probably older, older than that classification. But yeah, it's connected in, and uh, you know we had the nobles of the forest, the Arig Fado, then the Attic Fado, is the commoners of the woods, then the lower orders, the Throla Fado, and the Lossa Fado was the bushes of the wood, and they're all named in groups of seven. The gorse would be in the Lossa Fado, the bushes of the wood. The oak would be in the nobles, in the the spoiler for those, and the losser were the bushes. And that included the bramble, uh, gorse, bog myrtle, probably heather, ivy, all listed under Brehan Law and part of the. They would be what starts the cover ground when forest is cleared, and basically they start the succession process. The, the Ulm alphabet is 20 letters, of the tw 21st letter of each name of a native tree. The first five, the Bet, Lewis, Noon, Fern, Salia, all names of, of Irish trees. Again, we've lost the full meaning and understanding of Ohm. It's not just an alphabet. It's a set of numbers. Each one has a color. Because each of those trees, you would obtain a dye, either from the, the bark, from the leaves, from the fruits, from the roots in some cases. Uh, the Druid spoke of um, a place, the tree places to find wisdom at the edge of a stream or a river or the ocean beside the sea, between the mountain top and the cloud and the sky. It's the second place, and the third place is between the bark of the tree and the wood. That's the light, lit and life force of the tree flowing up and down. There's also references, vague, obscure references to place without dimensions. That refers to that space, the place without lines or breadth that cannot be uh, defined in space and time. So it's part of the wisdom tradition that, that we've lost again, very much associated with um, our forests. And you know, the Ohm is also associated with the musical notation of the harp. I was going to bring this up actually. Yes, we had on before um, a court man, Jared Banks. He, he mentioned the ohm, and he he talks about the idea of, as you've said, it relates to each tree, but the the sound of the letter relating to the, the noise that the wind made in the leaves and things like this, and that when we're looking at ohm, 
we're not looking at letters so much as we're we're looking at almost musical notation that oh. related to different sort of frequency sounds that the mouth yes. could make that related to the trees in some way as well. Like when I spoke of an each ohm is a number. Um, it, it's a vibration, which is a musical note as well. Ancient music is a pentatonic scale. That's five notes, five, 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 four groups of five notes, which directly relates to the ohm. Um, and there is a, a theory put, put out by a civil, civil servant, the poet secret, it's called, ohm. And he basically relates the ohm to the musical notation of the harp. Um, and again, the, the ohm symbols, you see, going back to the Druids would have viewed the view of the world, the world view was in triplicate. Basically, they saw the world through G-mat, the science of gematria, which is the science of numbers. Phonetics, which is poetry, sound, words. And the third was hieroglyphic, symbol, symbolism. And the combination of those three was how they, they viewed the world, almost a, a dream state. But each own character is also a hieroglyph. You know, I have thought about it myself, about, about the own and how each tree has a different musical song, has a song, because it's structured differently. And it will have a different song when it's in leaf and when it's without leaf, when the wind comes through it. Mm. And the structure of branches, etc., will, will form, you know, with, with wind, uh, a different song for each tree. But it's a fascinating, fascinating area, and it's one that we need to start digging digging into again to try to... I, I couldn't agree more. I think, I think like this all saying, like the people without a language is a people without, without an identity. And it seems so alien and obscure to us because it is so ancient. But it's a, it's what you're talking about here, you're saying that Ohm is sort of... The knowledge of Ohm is infused into the very nature of reality. It can be found in num numerology. It can be found in sound. It can be found in colors. It can be found in the, the, the trees around us. So I look at the, the, the Ohm. I actually have the alphabet up here on the wall in front of me. For some reason, it reminds me reminds me of the I Ching, and I wonder if, that, if there's any sort of similar connection there, because the I Ching is supposed to be a you know a way of divining based on the same principles. The idea that there is a frequency, there is a vibrational pattern that's throughout nature, and that the stones will fall a certain way. And also, another thing about Om that always stuck out for me is the very word itself, Om, is the word that they use in India for their transcendental meditation. They say Om, and this is that that letter in Hindu or in Sanskrit. It's supposed to be a letter that encompasses all the other letters and all the other sounds that the mouth can possibly make. It's the it's the sum total of all all of those vibrations, which to them is a sign of God. And I also think it's very interesting to make these leaps from Ireland to these other cultures because so much more research has been done in those cultures. But the problem in Ireland is the fact that the tradition is where uh, where halted stopped and stunted the, the amount of turmoil that was happening on the land and, all, and in the forests and all around meant that the laws um, could no longer continue to um, reflect to be studied and to be basically reflect to have a peaceful time to, times to actually develop in a way that they had done for 3,000 years I remember many years ago when I was speaking to yourself, Andrew, um, about these sort of topics, this idea of the Brehen being referred to as the Chuck the Crown, the Speaker of the Trees, as, op as opposed to we've got TDs today. Um, so the crown, being, the, the crown being the tree and the Chuck the Chuck being to talk. So the TD is Chuck the Doll, I can speak in the Doll. The Chuck the Crown was a word that was used for the Brehen, is that right? It is. Well, the Brehen gave judgment beneath or beside the sacred tree, the Billa. The, the tree was looked upon as a, a silent witness, a very reliable silent witness. And every Tua, every tribe had its sacred tree. And um, harken back to a time when, when the, the tree were, trees were venerated and were elevated in Irish society. Uh, you had sacred trees for the inauguration of kings. Mm. You take trees placed at uh, wells, at holy wells. Um, you had sacred trees sometimes either planted on the spot of where a warrior would have died or a great person to remember the trees associated with saints as Christianity came in. Trees, sacred trees beside churches. 
The churches were all placed on the sites of the, of the villa, of the sacred tree. And in some cases, you have kill, quill, which is connected with wood, also being the name for the church, Osberger. So you, they, they started to take over the old ways, appropriate, appropriate the old ways into the new. People were so connected and attached to these sites. And you have the, the five uh, divisions of Ireland, where the, you had five villas, the five ancient uh, villas of, of the five divisions, which is the, the Villa Tartan, the Villa Ishnok, the Craig Dahi, the Yo Rasa, the Yo Muna at Moon Abbey was um, a yew tree, and the other villas, the Villa Tartan at Ard Bracken. The Villa Ishnok was a giant ash tree at Ishnok, but they, they were supposedly connected with the, the five divisions of Ireland and were, were planted by what some character called uh, Trafilngid Trioker arrived at a great assembly at Tara at a time when Tara was the centre for assemblies. Again, the ancient Hebrews were lovers of trees. The, the Kabbalah, uh, the points on the Kabbalah were originally trees. And when the Middle East was deforested, they were replaced by precious metals. And it, you, you do have amazing connections with the Scythians, with the Phoenicians, the Egyptians. Connections, again, with trees and, and with sacred forests. And uh, he, Hebrew mothers uh, bore their children alone beneath the, an apple tree and came, you know did it alone, basically with the protection of the tree. Um, a number of words, ancient Hebrew words, match the Om, match the words of the Om. And I've seen that in a document from 1813 by a historian called O'Flaherty, who interviewed old people on the Aran Islands. He's doing a history of the Aran Islands. At this point, there was still a folk history, you know, a memory, a folk memory that uh, nobody had really paid much attention to because he was Irish. He obviously, and an Irish speaker, he could communicate. And they told him that at one time the Aran Islands was a great oak forest. It was in, in a, a center of learning. With the islands like Clan McNoise, uh, mm. Holy Island here in Loch Derg, uh, the, these centers of, of learning and wisdom were on islands. In, in a way, the hermet, like the hermetic tradition in the Middle East was the desert, go out into the desert or on, onto mountaintops. Uh, Ireland chose island. And mm. those islands basically were free to anybody, or the education, knowledge was free to anybody who came. In the Annals of the Four Masters, there's a reference to Holy Island, which is down here in East Clare. Basically, there's reference to Swiss, Scythians, Greeks, well, it's Hebrews, Egyptians, all coming to Ireland to learn. Uh, 16 ships at one point calling into Killaloo, looking for directions for Inish culture. Wow. So, well, I think it's interesting as well, even the name Aran Ireland, it has the root Ara, which is the Irish word for a noble or chief, and it also relates to the Sanskrit Arya. What you're saying ties into that there nicely as well. Just what, what it brings to mind here, um, a question I was asked recently, there was laws under the Breton law in relation to the, the felling of a sacred tree. You spoke about the nobles of the wood and things like that. Are you aware of, of within the Breton law, other protections for nature, as in for the rivers or other parts of the environment? I mean, I know we were dealing with a different time and they wouldn't have to be worried about things like pollution and things like that. Is there environmental protection laws aside from trees in the Breton law that you know about? Well, the, the Breton laws, um, they, they're more a set of principles, hmm. guidance for, for how to navigate navigate life um, and make sure ensure that the rights to all living beings and to the environment that supports the, the two of the, the people and their surroundings mm. so there's no specific they don't go into specifics but it but they are extremely as, as you know Kev, from looking at them they're extremely complex mm -hmm. and sophisticated in the detail they went because they were they kept evolving, they kept improving them, they kept um, evolving over a long time, over 3,000 years. They kept whittling them, customizing them according to new situations that would arise, um, new developments, new, new ideas that came in, something again that the English law cannot do. It, no. Back to 
or it has to keep going back. But the, if you take the laws to protect the trees, if you then understand how much the, the trees confer stability on water, on air, and on soil, they, they, they confer the fertility of the soil is coming from the trees. The, the protection and the, the vitality of water, the water streams and rivers the, are controlled by the root action of trees. So by protecting your trees, you're protecting your environment. And that goes back to another reason for setting up the Woodland League, was you, you're so many different groups set up to protect, you know, looking at different issues to do with the environment. It, our whole environment comes under the trees, basically. The trees are the, the stabilizers of our earth. They, they control our climate. We know that, you know. Basically, the more you look into what the trees do, what we can't even see going on, it, it's unbelievable, basically, how much that they uh, have an influence on ensuring all life systems and ecosystem services are functioning. The, the trees and the forests are a wonderful way um, but to reconnect. The Brehan Law is still alive, and the, you know the, this... Wisdom is, is, is always um, attainable. It's always there. The same wisdom that applied thousands of years ago still applies today. There's three words around their logo, and it's a part of one of those um, Celtic wisdom, tri Gaelic wisdom triads. I was talking earlier about the Druids' worldview was their tripartite view, and they, they had a whole system, a wonderful, huge amount, th probably thousands of kind of proverbs, that were in a triad form. And the one that surrounds the Woodland League logo is that what are the three candles which illuminate any darkness? And we're, you know, we're in a time of darkness in, in a way with so, so much negativity going yeah. on and disturbance and depression in some cases. And anyway, but the three candles which illuminate any darkness are Eksha, which is wisdom, Firna, which is truth. And Dura, which is the elements. So adhering to those three candles, if you stay close to wisdom, stay close to truth, and stay close to nature, you keep darkness at bay. And it, like the forests and the, the nature, it, it's a it's a, an abundant source of rejuvenation. And the connection to that source means you can never be alone. Nothing is ever lost. Hmm. We merely put things down, we, we leave things down, we've got to just go back and pick them up again. You know, it's all there. And that ties in also with the understanding and connection with the trees of one of the reasons why the tree was the silent witness of Abraham's judgment, why the tree was the silent witness of the inauguration of a king. And that's tied into the Druid understanding that the trees hold all knowledge all information, all wisdom, knowledge about the trees, they refer to it as the cosmic library. And that corresponds to the Sanskrit similar understanding which is the uh, Akashic records. The trees hold the Akashic records. And that is, they stand as silent witnesses in non-judgment and everything that's ever been in, in say, that's happened on this earth. They know. They, because they witnessed it. Remember, the trees are here 400 million years. They converted yeah. this rock from a lifeless place to this self-supporting um, ship sailing through the cosmos, basically, that we live on, that sustains us. Yeah. You know? And the trees played a huge role in that evolution. Humans are only half the time on this earth. So the trees are the longest living organisms, the oldest living, the largest organisms on Earth. You know, and some of the trees appear to be able to live forever, like the yew tree can live for five, six thousand years, appear to die right back into its roots and from its own roots come back up again. One of the reasons it was seen as a resurrection tree before mm -hmm. the Christian said resurrection, the trees were already there. In a sense, um, they, 
trees are life. You know, that expression is used and is known and is close enough to, to being the truth. <laughs>